Just how do you write a great film script? There are as many ways as there are writers. But when the going gets tough, when that burning issue that you're dying to discuss just won't find the satisfying dramatic form, there's always the conceptual tool. What is the conceptual tool? Well, it's any device or strategy that opens a bigger, inaccessible, complex idea and makes it simple to understand, makes it accessible and makes it dramatic. So you could say the X-ray is a conceptual tool. It allows us to see parts of our bodies and objects we couldn't normally see with the naked eye. You could say Sigmund Freud's talking cure is a conceptual tool. It gives us access to memories that would otherwise be repressed. The Italian director Vittoria De Sica and his writer Zan Ventetti wanted to discuss the deplorable post-war conditions in their country. Now, this is not exactly the pitch for a summer blockbuster. They needed a conceptual tool. But as you know, the Italians had joined the Allies to be on the winning side by the end of the war, but their country was in ruins. In 1948, not even the Italians wanted to discuss the deplorable situation in their country. They didn't need to. They were living it. They preferred the glamorous Hollywood films that took them away from all their problems. This is what the director De Sica was up against in 1948. The third biggest film was the Pale Face, starring Bob Hope and Jane Russell. The second biggest film was The Red River, starring John Wayne. And the worldwide smash, nothing even coming close, was the British film The Red Shoes. Note, two of those films were in colour. There's no way De Sica could afford colour. So, just what is Victoria De Sica's conceptual tool to take on these mega Hollywood blockbusters. It's this. For the Bicycle Thieves, 1948 is simply one of the most influential films ever made. It could be argued that without the Bicycle Thieves, there would be no On the Waterfront, no Hard Day's Night, one of my favourite films of all time, another of my favourite films, Raging Bull, and definitely no saving private Ryan. Why? This film introduced the style of neo-realism, which were all borrowed by the films I've just mentioned. De Sica's use of non-professional actors, the whole cast were amateurs. No sets were specially constructed. There were no costumes specially made. It was real as can be. Now, there could be a whole argument about what is real. Once you put a camera on something, point the camera, there's composition, there's this, that and the other, nothing is real. But it was a real antidote to the Hollywood glossy films. They used to call them the white telephone films, where the most modest secretary in the most modest Hello. job would drive a brand new car, mega size apartment and have a white Hello. telephone, hence why they call them the white telephone movies. Now, the neorealism is really part of the Maison scene. If you don't quite get the Maison scene, look at the previous uh, Doctor Script Doctor video on the film La Dalle Oblique, 1955. Fantastic film. And I explain Maison scene a little better there. But really, the bike is part of the conceptual tool. Now, The Bicycle Thieves 1948 is a road movie, just like Easy Rider is a road movie, or Little Miss Sunshine is a road movie, or As Good As It Gets is a road movie. Okay, it's a much more modest road movie because of this. But the destination in a road movie is usually incidental. The destination can sometimes be a bit of a letdown. It's about really exploring the unvarnished real nature of the country you happen to be living in. And of course, your real true nature. 
It's a journey to yourself. I teach creative writing and film studies. When the students here, they're going to be watching a black and white subtitled film for 90 minutes about a man looking for his lost bicycle. The riot commences. Yet some students have been so moved by the film, they've burst into tears at the end. Just how does the seeker do this? One of the techniques that the seeker uses is to give the bicycle anthropomorphic qualities. We're so used to seeing this in Walt Disney films uh, that we don't really notice it. We don't even know that it has a name. And this is where you give an animal or an inanimate object human qualities. We do this all the time. Some people actually complain about it. They say it's distasteful. Animal rights movement have a particular problem with it. Now, when we meet our hero, he's in a group of men and they're all arguing for jobs. There's only two of them and one of the jobs needs a bike. Ricky, don't forget, if you want this job, you need a bike. Look at the desperation on these men's faces. Let's remember now, they are not professional actors. Now, Ricky could just do, honey, I'm home, knock on the door and say, I found the job, honey, but the trouble is I need a bike, blah, blah, blah. Now, that's fine. That is actually the story. The only problem is we don't get to see what Italy looks like in 1948 if he does that. We're positioned in a different way. We meet his wife getting water in a communal well. Look at this. She's carrying these two buckets home. And it's a long walk back to their flat. They're showing us not only the situation that these two people are living in, but what's at stake? Now, there's a nice internal dynamic here. He's all defeated. He knows he hasn't got the money for a bite, but she's not defeated. She's going to go down fighting. Uh, they have two children that we've not been introduced to yet, and they're literally taking the sheets off their bed to, to buy this bicycle. Virtually the next shot is down at the pawn shop with other desperados trying to sell these sheets to raise enough money for this bicycle. By the way, did you notice that when she pulled the sheets off the bed, her husband was actually sitting on the bed. Now this looks like a small point to you, but it's not. It's one of the biggest rules of writing. Always have your hero right in the middle of the action. When you see a Raiders of the Lost Ark film, when there's water gushing in everywhere, he's not watching the water gushing, the water is splashing on him. Always have your hero in the middle of the action. So this is just not a bicycle. It's got anthropomorphic qualities. Look at the emotional investment in this bicycle. We as the audience also have this emotional investment. And now look at this. Just as they have this access to a stable life, the bike is put in jeopardy. His wife has stopped to see someone. He wants to know who it is and maybe ask her to put a bit of hurry up in it. But to do so, he's going to have to leave that bicycle behind. And as we said, this is a road movie. You're finding out about your country and yourself. All his wife is doing is seeing a clairvoyant. Clairvoyants and soothsayers have enormous power when you feel you have no control over your fate. Now we're introduced to the most important relationship in the movie. This is the father and son relationship. And notice the bicycle is centre stage again. The kid is cleaning the bike. Now these simple but potent relationships have been established. It's off to work what the bike is really for. Look at this man. He has dignity. He has the admiration of his son. And this is dad's job, putting up Hollywood posters representing the complete opposite of his modest existence. Note the bike is always in jeopardy.
Now the worst happens, the bike is stolen, and it can't be a coincidence that the uh, thief looks like he's wearing a German type military cap. This must be a comment on the war. He'll have to tell his son, but he chickens out when it's time to tell his wife. This leads to one of the most strangest but effective scenes I've seen in any movie. Father and son goes down to a bike market. He, the father is completely surrounded by bikes. The bikes are in pieces. It looks almost fetishy the way the bikes look. It reminds me of that phrase, water, water everywhere. None of these bikes are his and he can't afford to buy another one. The best he can do is hope that he'll see some evidence of his stolen bike here. Very strange scene, but it's not gratuitous. It's part of the narrative. A very important part of this movie is the son is a witness, a first-hand witness to his father's frustration, humiliation, desperation. For most modern people, the tribulations at work are kept far away from our children or our partner, not in the bicycle <laughs> At one heartbreaking <laughs> moment, as they look for this bicycle, the father just loses it with his son, which foreshadows <laughs> the end. Do you think this is going to end happily or otherwise? No! Now, is this the thief? It looks like the thief, wearing the same sort of German hat. The road movie theme continues. He chases the suspect to something that looks like a brothel. Again, his son is a witness to this altercation. It goes so badly wrong. His son will have to get the police, and it looks like even the local mafia has got involved Note the man in sunglasses. Now the son has to watch his father being run out of town by this mob. All for the sake of a bicycle. In fact, the son is so embarrassed he doesn't know if he should join his father or stay with the mob. Now, there's a very Italian ending that I do not want to spoil. What's happening is there's a football match. All the fans are inside. That means there's a lot of unattended bicycles outside. What's our hero going to do? Now, this film can be picked up quite cheaply on Amazon. It's worth seeing. Now, for screenwriters, for filmmakers working on a budget or just the enthusiastic film buff, The Seeker's Bicycle Thieves is not about bicycles at all. The bicycle is a conceptual tool that makes you think about more profound questions, but in the form of entertainment. Even in 1948, bicycles was a pretty threadbare form of transport. The Bicycle Thieves asks what's happening to a society where a man's autonomy, independence, dignity depends on this basic utility. I think it's perfectly credible to say I don't want to go to the movies to think I want to go and turn my brain off and just go for the ride. The first Die Hard movie is one of my favourite movies of all time. 
it is what it is. Actually, there's more to it than meets the eye, but that's for another time. But some films have actually changed the world for the better. I'm a fugitive from the chain gang in 1932, improved prison conditions in America. Come on, get up! I was just wiping the sweat off my face. But I got it knocked off. Ken Loach's Kathy Come Home, 1966. Improved state housing in the UK. Something I'm personally indebted to Ken Loach for. So well done, De Sica and the Bicycle Thieves. There's something to be said for the conceptual tool and neo-realism.